In May 1941, that of Hitler's confidence was sky high. Much of Europe had already been steamrolled, the British cowering on their islands, the French browbeaten and hopeless, the Americans still unwilling to join a conflict so far away from home. For the German Führer, everything he touched just turned to gold. With his armies massing on the border of the Soviet Union to begin Operation Barbarossa the following month, Hitler had a little housekeeper to do in Europe before launching the largest invasion in history. His focus lay on the strategically vital island of Crete, a hub for trade and movement for thousands of years and an important stepping stone to strengthening his grip across southern Europe and northern Africa. With less than 60,000 Allied troops on the island after a frantic and chaotic evacuation of mainland Greece, few held much hope that they could hold off the Nazi juggernaut for long. It was supposed to be a routine, yet although the Nazi invasion was successful, it was anything but straightforward. In just the first three days of the Battle of Crete, German losses were higher than every other conflict they had taken part in combined. Combination of uncharacteristically shambolic German planning, stern defense by the Greek and Allied soldiers, and ferocious resistance by the Cretan people turned the Battle of Crete into a nightmare for the Germans. For the first time, they were met with mass defiance from the local population, and their retribution uh, was predictably heinous. Yet this horror, handed out by the Nazis on Crete, was born out of genuine fear after what had happened. If the Battle of Stalingrad in Russia finally destroyed notions of German invincibility, the Battle of Crete knocked enormous holes out of it. The invasion of Greece had initially been placed in the hands of Hitler's ally Benito Mussolini, or rather the Führer's fascist friend had taken it upon himself to conquer nearby Greece, but the Italian army's venture south brought new meaning to the word shambolic. After seeing a final demand to cede territory rejected by the Greek Prime Minister, Mussolini ordered his troops across the Albanian Greek border on the 28th of October. In a matter of weeks, the poorly equipped, inadequately trained, hopelessly out of their depth Italians had been halted and gradually pushed back across the border. It was the first major fascist setback of the entire war, and it enraged Adolf Hitler. When Britain began reinforcing the beleaguered Greek army, Hitler took this as a direct threat to the fascist territory's southern flank, Bulgaria, after it had joined the Axis cause in March 1941 and began moving troops into the region. On the 6th of April 1941, Germany launched Operation Marita, and while the Italians had toiled for months in the mountains of northern Greece, Hitler's force, numbering 680,000, smashed their way south with devastating effect. By the end of the month, Athens had fallen, and the Greeks sent a sizable section of the remaining British, Australian, and New Zealand troops had surrendered. The German invasion of Crete was not a surprise. After bulldozing their way through Greece in weeks, there was no way that Hitler would allow a rebellious outpost to remain, especially as it now harbored just under 25,000 Allied soldiers and the fleeing Greek royal family. It was an open secret what was coming, though there was plenty of confusion over how and where the invasion would arrive. An amphibious assault would have been the preferred choice, but with the Royal Navy's ships prowling the area, Hitler and his commanders deemed it impractical and unworkable. Instead, with enormous air superiority in the region, an airborne invasion was chosen as the route onto Crete. Now, we've all seen the images and videos of vast numbers parachuting into northern France on D-Day, but in late April 1941, that kind of assault had scarcely been tried. In fact, Nazi Germany only had one major airborne assault under its belt at this stage of the war. On the 9th of April 1940, German paratroopers had landed in Denmark to take control of Arborg Airport in their country's north. It had been a remarkably successful operation, and its achievement was used to promote a similar action on Crete. From the 30th of April, when mainland Greece fell, Allied troops and their Greek defenders had nearly seven weeks to prepare as best they could for what they knew was coming. However, progress was hampered for several reasons. The Luftwaffe repeatedly targeted ships carrying goods to the island, sinking many, but operational decisions ultimately failed to prepare as best they could have been. In war, it's a little unfair to blame individuals who no doubt thought what they were doing was the best action, but the actions of Major General Bernard Freyberg, the man who oversaw the Allied forces on Crete, were far from perfect in hindsight. Despite several messages from the Enigma decoders at Bletchley Park that the Germans would be carrying out an airborne attack, Freyberg stuck stubbornly and firmly to his theory that the invasion would come from the sea. 
This led to several points, most notably the airfield in Malim being far from heavily defended. Instead, Allied troops were stationed in other areas of Crete, often staring out to sea, searching for ships that would never come. With the clock ticking down to the inevitable invasion, Allied and Greek forces did uh, what they could to reinforce positions. However, this was always a hopeless situation. The chaotic evacuation of mainland Greece had left behind much of the equipment and heavy artillery needed for any kind of formidable defense. The situation was so bad that soldiers had to dig trenches and foxholes with helmets rather than regulation shovels. Supplies and ammunition were low, as was morale after their chastening experience on the mainland. These well-trained soldiers would fight on regardless of circumstances, but few were optimistic about success. When German bombers stopped bombing Crete and commenced taking pictures instead, it was clear that the invasion would be airborne. Shortly before 8 a.m. on the 20th of March 1941, a legion of Junkers Ju-52 aircraft appeared above Crete, and within minutes, thousands of paratroopers were drifting slowly towards the Greek island. As I said at the start of today's video, pretty much everything had gone right for the Nazis up until that point in the war. But this is where things started to go very badly wrong. Casualties were appallingly high, often with almost entire regiments being wiped out. The next stage of the invasion involved gliders, which was equally disastrous. If the gliders did manage to land, they were quickly set upon by Allied or Greek troops, or the fearsome Cretan citizens themselves. Now, before we go any further with the invasion story today, it's worth taking a little more time to talk about the everyday men and women, and even children, who put up a monumental fight against the invading Nazi horde. From the start of the war until then, the Germans had faced very few, if any, major civilian uprisings. Yes, the soldiers of many nations had fought them hard, but when it came to non-combatants, open fighting was practically unheard of, with the only real exception being areas of Poland in 1939. As German paratroopers drifted down from the sky, many Cretan civilians grabbed what they could, often pitchforks, clubs, knives, or antique rifles, and rushed forward. There is one story of an elderly man clubbing a paratrooper to death with his walking stick as the German attempted to untangle himself from his parachute. Another tells of a young boy and a priest who broke into a nearby museum to retrieve a gun used in the Balkan Wars in the first decade of the century, and then they began shooting at the descending invaders. These were not isolated incidents, and they occurred throughout the zones targeted by the Germans. Not only did they have to contend with the Allied forces and the Greek soldiers fighting for their homeland, but the savagery and determination shown by the Cretan people stayed with the Germans long after they managed to gain a foothold in the island. As night fell on the 20th of March, the Germans were just about holding on, but they'd failed to secure almost all of their objectives. The most important had been the capture of Malim Airfield, which would have allowed a steady supply of resupplies and reinforcements, but it had been bravely defended by the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd New Zealand battalions. For many of the Germans, the situation was dire. A significant number had lost their weapons while descending or had been unable to retrieve weaponry parachuted separately, leaving them defenseless and reliant on others. When darkness came, those hardy German soldiers knew a concentrated counterattack would easily overrun their positions. This was one of those sliding doors moments. Had the Allied soldiers counterattacked the following morning or even during the night, most believe they would have succeeded and the vital airfield could have been held. This may well have been fatal for the invasion because what came next all came through Malim Airfield. As fate would have it for the Germans, Allied soldiers withdrew from Hill 107 overnight, leaving Malim undefended. This order has been debated over pretty much since. Uh, we know that a communication breakdown meant that one sector presumed the other had been overrun while it was in fact standing firm. As a result, the eastern section of Allied troops withdrew under the cover of darkness, with the west not realizing they'd gone until morning when they followed suit because they couldn't hold the line. While this might seem like an enormous blunder, and indeed it was to some degree, the situation was at least understandable. These soldiers were running dangerously low on ammunition and supplies, while daybreak would have also brought renewed airstrikes from the Luftwaffe. However, it's difficult to imagine that the weak German positions couldn't have been taken if the two sectors had appropriately communicated and attacked together. Instead, doubtless to disbelief, the Germans woke to find Malim airfield undefended and just walked in freely. It was a stroke of unbelievable luck that swung the entire battle in their favor. 
Immediately, German reinforcements began arriving and fortifying their invaluable new position. Two separate counterattacks by the Allies over the next two days came to nothing, again with more than an element of misunderstanding and failed opportunities. The primary reason was that the Allies were now fighting on multiple fronts. An amphibious landing of German troops was repulsed by the Royal Navy on the 22nd of April, a pattern that repeated itself in the coming days. Casualties and aircraft or ship losses mounted for both sides as the Royal Navy did what it could to keep the Kriegsmarine supported by the Italian Navy. At bay. On the 28th of April, the Germans had more success when they ingeniously beached a wooden ship carrying two panzer tanks, which immediately rumbled into the thick of the action. After just over a week of fighting, the Germans had consolidated their positions, reinforced them with fresh troops, and pushed the Allies and Greeks southward. Despite having a numerical advantage, the Allies had missed their opportunity. With more paratroops and mountain troops arriving on Crete, the German tide just became unstoppable. However, this tsunami didn't go unchecked, since both the Allies and the Greeks put up a hell of a defense to allow for a full retreat. The fighting around Castelli, west of Malim, had been ferocious from the very start. Greek civilians joined the remaining Greek soldiers en masse in a heroic last stand, and a dwindling ammo reserve, they were no match for the marauding German army. Things would get significantly worse for the citizens of Castelli when the town fell. This area had seen some of the most concerted fighting by the civilian population. And when German troops arrived and found paratroopers still hanging from the trees, killed instantly where they fell, their retribution was horrific. 200 Greek male hostages were executed, and more was to come for the soon defeated Cretans. With the battle increasingly hopeless, Allied troops poured southward, where a planned evacuation to transport soldiers across the Mediterranean to Egypt would occur. The problem was the speed of the German advance left space for maneuvering. It was a situation that required one of those courageous sacrifices that we often see in films. And what came next became known as the Battle of 42nd Street. Allied troops were now in full retreat, but they needed covering to give the bulk of the forces enough time to make it to the southern shore. On the 27th of May, several severely understrength and badly battered Australian and New Zealand infantry battalions formed a defence line along the Hania to Sicilaria Road, southeast of Chania on the north coast. The location had been where the 42nd Field Company of Royal Engineers had recently camped, hence the nickname, but as the German 5th Alpine Division drew closer, orders to halt them at all costs were given. The first to arrive was the 1st Battalion of the 140. 41st Gerbersjager Regiment, numbering around 400 men. Exact details of what came next are a little sketchy, but there are reports of either one or several Maori soldiers standing up and roaring out the Ka Mate, the song that accompanies the Haka before rushing forward, soon joined by others around them. In an act of war heroism worthy of any Hollywood film, the Australian and New Zealand battalions bayonet charged the Germans, driving them back nearly a mile and killing more than half of the regiment. Forty Anzac soldiers died in the attack that many agree was the most effective counterattack by Allied troops during the entire battle, particularly considering these were troops at the edge of their physical and mental endurance. In the grand scheme of things, it was a minor success, but it's thought the resulting delay allowed nearly 12,000 Allied troops to be evacuated from the island. Such was the ferocity of the skirmish, the Germans actually attempted to bring war crime charges against those who had taken part, stating that the soldiers who had wanted to surrender were killed. Though, unsurprisingly, those charges didn't stick. Just over 18,000 Allied troops were successfully evacuated from Crete before the final surrender on the 1st of June, with around 12,000 still on the island when it finally fell. Many were taken prisoner, though some disappeared into the mountains to join the partisans, a story so enthralling that it probably deserves its own video. Let us know in the comments if you want that. The brave resistance on Crete continued throughout the entire war, with sabotage and killings infuriating Adolf Hitler, who eventually had to use as many as 100,000 German troops to subdue an island less than half the size of Wales, or twice the size of Rhode Island. The exact number of Germans killed or wounded during the invasion is a little unclear. Some say 5,000 to 6,000, while others place the figure at over 10,000. Whatever the figure, it was dramatically higher than anything the Germans had experienced up to that point in the war. The resulting retribution handed out to the Cretans for daring to resist was frequently horrifying. The village of Candanos was razed entirely, and 180 citizens were murdered on the 3rd of June. This had been the site of some of the bravest civilian fighting, but the chilling message left by the Germans said it all. Here stood Candanos, destroyed in retribution for the murder of 25 German soldiers, never to be rebuilt again. Massacres took place across the island, but were mainly concentrated in the regions where the civilians' defense was most bloody and robust. 2,000 Cretans were executed in the first month of occupation alone, with another 25,000 killed during the three-and-a-half-year occupation. 
What effect this had on the German war machine has long been debated. Some say it delayed Hitler's invasion of Russia, which eventually caused its failure. However, it seems the invasion date had been agreed upon long before the invasion of Crete, although plans were changed in light of the near-catastrophic failure of the airborne assault. It may not have greatly affected Operation Barbarossa, but it seems clear that Hitler was forced to keep more troops in Crete than he wanted, eventually weakening his position in northern Africa. However, it wasn't timelines or troop numbers that were the most affected. The German army had gone into Crete with an air of invincibility after easily sweeping all before them. Whether nations would freely admit it or not, facing the Germans carried an aura of tragic inevitability. But that all changed after Crete. What happened on this tiny Mediterranean island was a chastening experience for the German army, the Luftwaffe, and the Kriegsmarine. They may have succeeded, but they did so battered, bleeding, and by the skin of their teeth. The horror of Stalingrad was to come, but the Battle of Crete cracked that German invincibility for the very first time.